Welcome to our discussion of chapter two. I'm Roberta Lavin and I will be guiding you through this chapter. Chapter two is understanding key sign steps and steps in quantitative and qualitative research. Please read your book before watching the video. It will help you to highlight the important aspects of the chapter. The authors do a good job with examples and I encourage you to review them. We, I will cover three learning objectives for today. Number one, we will define quantitative and qualitative research. We will distinguish the experimental and non-experimental research and we will discuss the differences in the sequence of activities in quantitative and qualitative research. In this chapter, we will begin our discussion with the different language of qualitative and quantitative research. Don't be concerned if it seems like a foreign language to you. By the end of the semester, these terms will be familiar and you will use them with ease. For now, just try and be familiar with the language. You may even want to create some flashcards to help you learn the new language. Let's walk through some of these items. You have concepts in both quantitative and qualitative research. For example, the person creating the information in quantitative research is usually referred to the subject or the study participant, whereas in qualitative research they can be called the study participant, but they're also called informants or key informants. The person undertaking the study is the research investigator in both. That which is being investigated in quantitative research is concepts, constructs, and variables. And in qualitative, it is phenomena and concepts. We will cover some of this. In for information gathered is data, usually numerical values for quantitative, and for qualitative, it's usually, the data is usually narrative and narrative descriptions. The concepts between, con the connections between concepts and quantitative research are relationships. They are essentially looking for cause and effect or associations, whereas in qualitative research, you're looking for patterns of association. As you go through the semester and read some articles of both types, this will become more obvious to you. And then the logical reasoning process. Deductive reasoning is used in quantitative things, and inductive reasoning is used in qualitative things. Some of you may be asking what some of these terms mean. Let's review some of them. Researchers generate concepts by generalizing from particular facts. Concepts are based on our experience. A concept is a noun that stands for a class of objects. Concepts can be based on real phenomena and are a generalized idea of something of meaning. For example, examples of concepts include common demographic measures age, income, education level, number of siblings, and gender, just as a few. Constructs exist at a higher level of abstraction than concepts. Justice, beauty, happiness, and health are all constructs. Constructs are considered latent variables because they cannot be directly observable or measured. One example, well known to many nurses, is the construct of self-care from Orem's model of, of health, ma health maintenance. If you search measures and measurements, you can find more information on these terms. A theory is an evaluation of some aspect of reality. The concepts and constructs are put together in the theory in a way that is used to explain the world. I think theory is 
is important because one of the things it does is it helps you put your work and your thoughts and all these concepts you're dealing with and constructs every day into this tidy little box that helps you to remember it and understand it and see the patterns. Now, we also refer to deductive and inductive reasoning related to quantitative and qualitative uh, research. Deductive reasoning is a basic form of valid reasoning. Deductive reasoning or deduction starts out with a general statement or hypothesis and examines the possibilities to reach a specific, specific logical conclusion. It links premises and conclusions. Inductive reasoning is the opposite of deductive reasoning, and I'm sure at this point in this course that is not helpful. But inductive reasoning makes broad generalizations from specific observations. Basically, there is data, then conclusions are drawn from that data. This is called inductive logic. As I said, I would write some of these definitions down and it will help you to remember them. By the time the semester is over, you will probably know this and it will seem normal to you and right now, I know it's a lot of new language. Variables need a little more discussion. It is, it is critically important for you to understand the difference between independent and dependent variables. In quantitative studies, concepts are called variables. Variables are measured. If something can be classified into two or more categories, it is a kind of variable. Variables vary, thus the name. For example, if you study lung cancer, then smoking could be a variable. How many children I have may be a variable that gives quantitative information, but my blood type is also a variable, but it only gives categorical information. Now, let's talk about dependent and independent variables. This is important for you to understand and remember. We just talked about smoking and lung cancer. If we ask the question, does smoking cause lung cancer, then smoking is the independent variable because it is presumed to affect the dependent variable, which is lung cancer. Kerlinger de defined it this way, an independent variable is a variable that is presumed to influence another variable called the dependent variable. We talk of conceptual and operational definitions. A conceptual definition is a theoretical meaning of a concept. An operational definition specifies what the researcher must do to measure the concept and collect the needed information. Kerlinger describes it as assigning meaning to the construct or variable by specifying the activities or operations necessary to measure it. It is like the instruction manual for the, for the researcher. The operational definition serves as a bridge from concepts to the observations. You will see um, here, a paper um, about care teams in acute care hospitals, and it provides both the conceptual and the operational definitions. Let's look at, a t at the team leader. The conceptual definition is having a dedicated person with processes, skills, and knowledge to facilitate effective functioning of a team by encouraging the team members to engage in teamwork. Ensure each member understands their role and providing a work environment that is conducive to work on a team. Then the operational definition is demonstrating leadership practices that role model and, and, and encourage the same teamwork. 
So it's not just the teamwork, but it's the behaviors, providing clear expectations, and with a positive work environment. Clearly, this still requires a measure. We will talk about this in future chapters. Let me give you one more example that might be a little more clear. If we are considering environmental measures and, and what we think about is connectivity, we might, we might have the extent to which a street is connected with its local or immediate neighbors as a conceptual definition. The operational definition would be the mean value of the connectivity measures of all streets with a half mile radius from a survey of participants residential block. Let me try to put this into language that will be a little more clear to us. Many of us will see from on high as nurses uh, new state requirements that come down about something related to nursing. The type of the, you know, the type of syringes we need or safe patient handling. And then you will get somebody that puts out a policy that says, oh, we must do this nursing procedure because there's this new law that says we have to do this or this new regulation or this new guidance. So they make a policy that tells you you have to do it, but it doesn't really tell you how to do it. And after that, we usually come someone that says, okay, now we need an instruction guide. And the instruction guide says, here's how you do it, here's how we know we did it, and here's how we're going to measure it to show those people that wrote this in the first place that we, we did what they said to do. Try to keep it a little bit simple in your head, like one's the policy and one's your procedure manual about how you do it and how you show you did it effectively. When we speak about data, we are talking about pieces of information that we gather in a study. The type of information collected is different for qualitative and quantitative research, and we, we've already covered that piece. But please pay attention to this because throughout the course, I will be asking you to select different types of articles. It is important to know the difference, so you select the correct type of research article. Let's begin with quantitative data. The data will be numeric. This is important. Quantitative data, the data will be numeric. So if we're thinking about this, let's, let's say qualitative. If we're talking conceptually, then we are concerned with understanding the human behavior from the informant's perspective. And it assumes a dynamic and negotiated reality. So from the informant's perspective, for us, if we are working with our patients, then that informant would be the patient. In quantitative, it's concerned with discovering facts about social phenomena, and it assumes fixed and measurable reality. That is, there's not much in nursing that's fixed. Um, there's a lot that's measurable, but there's not a lot that's fixed. It's why you see so much qualitative research in nursing. Methodolo the methodological of things that we need to consider are how we collect data. So data are collected through persistent observation and interviews and qualitative studies. The data are analyzed for themes from descriptions from the informants, and the data are reported in the language of the informant. In other words, while we may put themes, we try to stick to the language of the informant. Whereas in quantitative studies, the, the data are collected through measures that are analyzed through numeric comparisons and statistics, and they are reported through statistical analysis. Qualitative data is narrative. 
So that's one way to also remember it. Quantitative data has numbers, lots of numbers and statistics, and qualitative data is narrative. There are major classes of quantitative and qualitative data. In quantitative data, we have experimental research um, that actively introduces interventions. For example, clinical trials, when people are trying to figure out if a new medication works. And then there's non-experimental research where the researchers are bystanders and collect data without intervention. And, and we talk about big data sometimes, and what we'll do is we'll go into the databases of the big data and the, and the patient record system, and we will look at that data. Um, that would be non-experimental because there is no intervention. And then I included a table below of multiple types of qualitative research. So you can look at this as case studies, grounded theory, phenomenology, ethnography, and historical. Again, I would, I've given you the link to this. I would pull this up and take a look at it. It's important for you to remember as you start looking through research articles to know what kind of article it is. And remember, one of the things I ask you to do is fill in a table and it will ask you questions in that table that this will help you to answer. I, I put in this flow chart from your textbook. It is figure 3.1. It's the steps in, quantita in a quantitative study. So it breaks down the phases one through five, and then it gives you the steps within each phase from the concept to the design, to the empirical phase, to the analytical phase, to the dissemination of your research. And then you have another uh, figure in your book, figure 3.2, that does the same thing for qualitative research. And if you notice, the quantitative process was fairly linear and, and it went in a straight path. And you will notice the qualitative process is more circular. You start out with planning this study and identifying your problems, you're doing your literature review, your overall approach. You have to get entree into the research sites and develop the methods and safeguards for the patients. And then you develop data collection strategies and then you gather and analyze data. In qualitative research, you may at times have to go back to the developing and data collection strategies and you may have to adjust those somewhat. In the end, it all ends with dissemination of the findings. <laughs>